Nick and Nate Diaz are both very fascinating characters, however it did not start this way. If you are a recent fan of mixed martial arts and you only know who Nate Diaz is, I wanted to delve into the story of both brothers, tell you about Nick's background, tell you about Nate's background, and how Nick Diaz got Nate started in MMA. As kids their dad was not around much, and Nick was forced to be the leader of the pack. They had a younger sister named Nina, and Nick began training from a young age, starting in Aikido and Sambo. He then saw a fight for Henzo Gracie, and was inspired to train in mixed martial arts. However, I want to tell you about this story regarding his high school years about his girlfriend. Now Nick Diaz goes on here to talk about his girlfriend Stephanie. He talks about how she used to try and make him jealous with someone that he used to know but someone that you wouldn't want to piss off because he walks around with a gun. And then he says, Before I ever had my first pro fight, July 5th 2000, Bart had a party at his house. The night before, Stephanie had told me she loved me. After the party, I was going to go back to her house with her brother. He was my best friend, but some friends weren't doing well and headed to my house so I had to go. An hour later I got a call from her mum saying, are you with Stephanie? She took me up and down by my grandma's house next to their trailer park. There was a wreck on the freeway. I jumped the fence and saw only one car and ambulances. She had walked and killed herself on the freeway. The girl I loved more than anything had tried to kill herself for the third time and succeeded. She was going to go to college. She was an avid student and was doing everything I couldn't while living in a trailer park where everyone was doing dope. Meanwhile, I focused my whole high school years worried about what her and her friends would think if I lost a fight to her ex-boyfriend and football friends. After that, I was grown up. It was all over. I wasn't a kid anymore. I won my first fight in the first round with a choke and all I could think about was her, just like when I was in school. I would run seven miles and back to her grave just to promise her I would make it as a fighter, like she knew and had told me she knew and was proud of me. Now of course this isn't a typical story of the fighter, you know, someone who grew up in gyms and was very talented and had great work ethic and things like that. This was something that Nick enjoyed doing and he was inspired by Henzo Gracie. However, it appears that the only person who ever believed in him was his girlfriend Stephanie at the time. So when when she passed away it appeared to give him that emotional push because a lot of the time when you're when you're aiming towards something it's okay to have the work ethic it's okay to have the thinking but of course you need to align your heart with your mind and even though this is a very tragic story it appears as though her passing away was the exact emotional alignment he required and he then used that as motivation now talking about nate diaz's entry into the mixed martial arts world it's not necessarily we were sitting in the middle of violence. We were just very aware of everything Nate Diaz said. If someone was getting into it, there was a fight. You would see fights all the time. I'll go other places and nobody fights. When Nick was first fighting in the UFC and going, what motherfucker? People were like, wow, this guy is crazy. That was just a natural thing to us. All that was normal. You say that in places outside of Stockton and guys are like, whoa, what's the problem here? We're like, are we fighting right now? Now Nate tells a story about how when he was younger, there would be a food truck that stops outside the gym each night and when Nick used to train he would usually buy Nate Diaz some food from burritos from a food truck but when Nate was usually starving at home so Nate Diaz then went on to say that was actually the main reason I wanted to go train I didn't have any money at home we didn't have shit. I was starving all day so if I went to train I'd get something to eat sometimes I'd be sitting at home and it was like well if I go train with Nick I'll get something to eat afterward if I don't I'll just sit there and be hungry I was going for burritos and dinner and hey I wanted dinner every day Day. Before I knew it, I was a blue belt. So of course Nate was incentivized to train just because he needed food. But Nick also maybe understood how his brother worked, that he needed some kind of motivation. And he understood his brother enough to motivate him in a certain way that maybe could get him the training. That way he could keep Nate out of bad circles. Because Nate had even said before, when he was younger, he would a lot of the time just waste time, hang out with his friends, not really care about training, he didn't have the discipline that his brother had. And everyone would always say, why does your brother train so much the bullying the picking did that happen to you as a kid and is that why you don't <laughs> no. tolerate it uh okay hell nah. you never that never happened to you 
No, I have a big brother, man. That's no right. Mess with me. So when you're younger and you spend time with your siblings, even if it's doing something where you guys clash all the time, you may even not like your sibling in that moment. But because you end up spending so much time with, in this case, Nate was spending more time with Nick training and training and training. Even if he didn't enjoy training all the time, he's subconsciously spending more time with Nick and it builds more rapport. And you can see the way he talks about Nick in that clip. He has so much respect for Nick Diaz because Nick was almost his leader without him even realizing it. Nick was setting the example for him. He understood how to motivate him and Nate actually subconsciously was programmed by Nick. How important is your brother to the support system getting through all the media and stuff? My brother is the most important thing to me. Um, probably more important, you know, more important than anything. A lot of time it's why, um, it's why, you know, I have to push forward and do so good because I can't, you know, um, there would have been a lot less pressure on me if I didn't have a younger brother. I'm mean, happy I do. I'm <laughs> happy I do have a younger brother. I have a great, great um, younger brother and training partner. And uh, I'm really um, grateful and thankful for that. Now, at this point, it appears that Nick may be gaining some notoriety in the local community or at the local gym, that he is a good prospect and is going to transition into fighting at this point. And Nate goes on to say, Nick had mats, a weight bench and a TV. He would watch old fights in his bedroom. People would come over to challenge Nick to a fight and he would say, if you tap out my brother, I'll roll with you. Nick would come in my room and wake me up. I'm this skinny 15 year old kid and he'd say, roll with this guy quick. I would go in his room and choke these guys out. And if anybody could choke me out, the first thing I'd say was all right now let's box we talked about the programming that nick diaz implemented this is nate diaz's environment he doesn't know any different and when you're at a young age where your mind can still be manipulated in a good way or a bad way you're going to naturally cater to the environment around you and his environment was fighting this is what he knew he didn't know whether it was a bad thing a good thing that's why he was surprised when he went to different places around the u.s and was saying why are people so surprised by fighting this is all i've ever known and nick instead that in him so that he could transition into fighting a lot easier because everyone knows that fighting is incredibly intimidating and scary but if you're okay with fighting already then perhaps it could make the bridge a little bit easier i had never asked a question before it was fight that guy okay that guy okay it was a psycho militant lifestyle and he did transition this exact mindset into his ufc career when he got there if you've ever been a fan of either of the diaz brothers you understand that this was one of the reasons why we like these guys so much they never ever backed out of a fight they would always be down to fight whoever it was once nick diaz began his fighting career he fought nine times in two years he accumulated a seven and two record in mma and then fought in the ufc he had a strange tenure in the ufc but his most famous knockout was probably his finish of robbie lawler although he had a good start in the ufc his first run in the ufc was very interesting he went off to a great start and he got two finishes finishes over Jeremy Jackson and Robbie Lawler. The Robbie Lawler knockout was actually one of his most famous knockouts. They still show highlights of it today. Even though I wasn't a fan of mixed martial arts back when this fight happened, I remember I'd seen this highlight so many times of him hitting Robbie Lawler and dropping Robbie Lawler with that punch. So it was a massive, massive deal back then. Now, just an interesting fact about that fight, Nick Diaz actually only got paid $6,000 for that fight. Uh, I just, I just, I just knew, you know, he's my age, he's not going to beat me, nobody's going to beat me that's my age, okay, for one, okay, I'm 20 years old, we're not going to see no 20 year old people coming in here whooping my ass. Nick Diaz was someone who was so brutally honest. He was incredibly raw with everything he said. And it was more of a what you see is what you get type of persona with Nick. He also had just an incredible fighting style. He was so well versed on the ground, a massive threat, but he would never initiate a takedown. Reason being is he wanted to use his hands and fight people on standing up. He was even willing to take a few punches to deliver a few. And his style made for such exciting fight. He would also trash talk the hell out of his opponent. Whether it was a jiu-jitsu scramble or even a toe-to-toe -to -toe war, Nick was going to show how much hard he had every time in the octagon he was incredibly hard to finish and he was someone who used his toughness to outlast people and break their will now he continued to have a couple more wins along with a loss and then he went on a streak of a few losses where he seemed to be getting out grappled and it wasn't it wasn't that he wasn't a good grappler he had a lot of technical exchanges on the ground with the three opponents he lost to which was sean shirk joe riggs and diego sanchez it was just that they were able to keep the top control and win the rounds in the judges eyes so even when nick diaz was on the ground he never felt as though he was losing the fight it was just the way that mma is scored and still is today in that wrestling gives you an advantageous position 
Now, even though Nick Diaz lost these fights, his fight with Joe Riggs was very telling. This is where we learned a lot about his personality. It wasn't in the fight or, or just after the fight, it was actually when they ended up in the hospital. They had a massive altercation in the hospital and pretty much a street fight in the hospital. Hello, what's up? This is Nick Diaz. Nick Diaz! What happened at the hospital? I told him you come over here and I'm gonna beat your fucking ass. You know, I already talked shit after the fight, we're in the back. And I was all, fuck you, you fucking bitch, I'll fight you all night. Because, you know, he's over here, you know, talking to a bunch of people and stuff. And I was all, fuck you. And he's all, ah, fuck you. I, he's all, whatever, fuck you. He's all, I won. Go back to the WEC. And I was all, fuck you, you fucking bitch. I'll still fight your little bitch ass. If you don't want to fight me right now, you'll get your fucking ass whooped. And so when he did, he walked all the way over to my room. He, he knew better than to come over by me. He knows I'm fucking nuts. Like, he knows I'm crazy, like, <laughs> outside of a door. You know what I mean? I'll fight him all night. He's here right now. I'll fight him right now. I ain't no bitch. I'm out of the hospital, though. And I fucking knocked him down. And then he got up and started trying to take me down. And then I put double underhooks. <laughs> I took it outside. But I hopped him into his room. I started punching him in the face up against the wall in his room. But he was like, you know, he was like, get your brother, man. Get your brother, man. You know, I'm like, fuck you. And then cops came in, I figured the cops would have arrested us, but they were, they, they were Nick Diaz fans or whatever, you know, they one of them got on the autograph. <laughs> <laughs> one of them got on the autograph, I couldn't believe it, yeah, we are in Vegas, you know, so I figured that's the reason why. Oh. We started to learn actually about how Nick Diaz approaches these fights where this is not just business to him If you're gonna be on the other side of the octagon to him, this is personal I'm coming for you at all times. Even when the fight's over, we're still enemies. Do not wish me good luck I'm here to kick your ass all the time. This is personal for me. You're threatening me. This is not just a, reg a professional fight to me This is not a sport to me. I'm going to war with you. I'm not living in fantasy delusion I don't walk out there going, okay, this is tennis, you know I have people come up to me and try to shake my hand and smile at me and they try to wish me good luck. Why are you going to have good luck for, you know, I mean, why are you going to say, like, good luck to me? I'm going to come, you know, and uh, I try to wreck you tomorrow. After these three losses, Nick ended up bouncing around to a few different promotions along with a couple more fights in the UFC, including Strikeforce, Dream, Pride and Elite XC. This was the beginning of all his controversial moments. He, he gained the monarch of the bad boy of MMA for several reasons. He was involved in a lot of brawls, a lot of trash talk within the cage. He would create animosity with opponents and it would create a lot of interest. But we found him fascinating. We just respected how real he was. And we as fans respected him as a badass. You know, we, we loved it. We, we couldn't stop watching him. Double. Fuck you. Now, Nick Diaz's following was very cult-like. He was sort of public enemy number one. He had beef with everyone, everywhere he went. Come on, don't be scared, homie. Just never knew what he was going to do next and that's why it was so exciting to watch him his fighting style was just unbelievable he was just in these wars every time and he was very outspoken about a lot of issues whether it was fighter pay smoking weed he was pretty much the first person to discuss weed during training camps during training or anything like that things that you just shouldn't talk about but he opened the door to those sort of things and now it's so normal we see it all the time nick was actually one of the first people to be outspoken about it like robbie lawler i was smoking weed that day i didn't think there was anything wrong with it sure before i walk into the gym i'm gonna smoke some weed i'm like shit i want to wait or we're gonna have to wait until we, we leave to smoke better smoke right now i mean so no back then too you wouldn't have been able to tell anybody like that you were smoking weed when i'd come in i didn't want no one to know i was fucking lit but i wasn't about to go in some hour appointment of any type or workout or anything without like you know smoking a little weed first so but when i would i was fucking lit and i didn't want to talk to nobody and i was like shit they're gonna know i'm high so i would start working out like crazy like, okay, we're in a gym. What do you do here? Work out. Well, that's what I'm doing. I got, I would get right to it and I would jam out and I would be in a hurry to break a sweat and get into a workout so that I'm not high anymore, but I'd still be high, but just not I've been a comfortable high. He would also talk a lot about the rule sets and how the Japanese system of fighting was much better with the yellow card system for stalling. He was always sticking up for certain things that he believed in. I understand, you know, what it feels like to be held down for three rounds. This guy is avoiding the fight now. You get yellow carded if he holds the guy, that, so it forces him, you know, okay, to punch the guy. He can't just elbow the guy because he has to create some space to punch, you know? So he can't just hold the guy and cheat with little bumpy, you know, bumping the guy with little elbows. He has to create an amount of space 
you know, away from this guy to, to punch down on him. That, that space that he needs to make before he gets yellow carded is the same space I might be trying to make so that I can get my ass back up and fight this guy when he's not trying to fight me. So he should be carded for stalling. And here and everybody's, you know, bought up the other organization and thrown it away, tried to hide it. But in the judge's eyes, the other guy won. But when I went home, you know, and they went home, they know who really won the fight, you know what I mean? And he was just unapologetically himself. And we really respected that about him. And that's why I think he got so much shine. I'm all right. Uh, you know, I wasn't going to do this interview, but they told me I had to. So, they, you know. Something against me? Do you not like me, Nick? I, I feel like you instigate fights quite a bit, but, uh, you know, that's... Fights between the fighters? Yeah. I mean, maybe that's your, that's your job, but where I come from, you know, people like that get slapped. At this point, it became cool to like Nick Diaz, the headlining act. Uh, are you trying to start shitting me and uh, Nick Diaz? You know, where I come from, guys get slapped for doing that. Shit. His natural ability to be controversial ended up serving him in a lot of fight promotion, along with Scott Coker's ability in Strikeforce to promote him. It put Strikeforce on such a great platform, and their matchmaking ability created incredible fights, which served Nick Diaz's fighting style and his performances showed. Nick Diaz was the perfect villain that was shrouded in gold by the fans. Along with Nick Diaz, even the fans who believed in him also adopted the mindset of, if you're not with us, you're against us. As in, if you're not a fan of Nick Diaz, we don't like you. It was uh, the Gomi fight. He tested positive for the Gomi fight, and they said there was so much weed in his system when they tested him that he had to be high when he was fighting. So, and then he went out there and fought Takanori Gomi and just outboxed him. You're bad, <laughs> Hopefully by now you've understood that there was a special spark about Nick Diaz that we were drawn to. This isn't it at its maximum peak just yet, but I want to delve into Nate Diaz's story first and then hopefully align the next two timelines. So now I'm moving into Nate Diaz's story. Also, please subscribe if you like the video. Now the Diaz brothers had actually insulted the reality TV show that the UFC host called The Ultimate Fighter and Dana had challenged Nate to come on the show. Now Dana Wyatt clearly recognized that Nick Diaz had such an exciting fighting style. <laughs> I'm actually really excited to see Nate fight. Uh, he comes from a family of fighters. His brother Nick Diaz has fought in the UFC many times and he's tough as nails. The Diaz brothers are angry at everyone. Like that? Get out. So in recruiting his brother, he could promote the show using Nick Diaz's name because of his little brother's value, but he could also maybe get some exciting fights because the likelihood of Nate Diaz also being an exciting fighter is quite likely because they train together, they're brothers, they probably have the same philosophies, and it did actually end up for a very entertaining season when Nate shows so much personality, and in the end, he did end up saying that this show was very hard and he definitely underestimated this show. They did build a lot of character within him. Just random side note, this is my favorite season of The Ultimate Fighter. We learn through Nate Diaz's tenure on The Ultimate Fighter how he justifies fighting in his mind. I fight because this is just what I like to do, man. If that, like, this is the best job in the world, I think. We know that Nick had played a massive role in contributing to Nate Diaz's philosophy with this mindset of fighting, mainly through the fact of forcing him to fight random strangers that would come to their house. But we see Nate Diaz justify it in his own mind. That's when he's taken ownership of it now. He's never ever going to say, I only fight because Nick told me to. He's now justified it in his own mind, thereby giving him more confidence to go out there and scrap. What we admire about this season with Nate Diaz is that he never veered away from the hard fight. Where I live, I'm not afraid of anybody in that house, you know? Emerson's the one to step up, so he's the one who thinks he's hard here. Whatever, let's do it. I mean, that's who I want to fight then. He was actively looking for the toughest guy in each bout that he had, and he finished all three bouts by a submission. It was a really great performance by him. His consistency with his performances was so great, and he showed great personality. He was really funny and got involved in a lot of pranks and things like that. But then we had to see some controversy, surely, right? I mean, he is a Diaz brother after all, and we definitely did get some of that. I saw it said, Team Pulver, suck it. I'm Team Pulver, you know? So I took it offensive towards me. So suck the Team Pulver out there, motherfuckers. If you got anything to take me, say it to me, motherfucker. Suck my dick, all right? Whoever said that. Dude, I, I wrote, wrote that wall. shit. Bro, that goes to whoever wrote it. I wrote it, all right? Well, fuck you, yeah, bitch. Fuck what? You want to fight in the house? Go. Yeah, motherfucker. Not in the house. Not in the house. Not in the house. Not in the house. Yo, not in the house. 
Suck my, suck my dick, bitch. If somebody writes that shit towards me, I'm fucking socking somebody on site. I don't give a fuck. They all turn into little bitches like it's a game. Ha ha ha, it was a joke. You know, that shit ain't funny to me. I think we've all met someone like Nate Diaz in our life who, you know, that if you push them too far across the line, they're going to take it in a certain way and that you need to be quite tactful when you deal with them. That's Spanish. Good out there, Spanish. And all of a sudden, I kind of pay attention. I'm like, holy shit, they really going to fight. Get back, homie. What? What, motherfucker? Why are you looking at me like this? You're the one looking at me all serious. The jokes ain't funny to me. Oh, it's not? Can you keep your fucking hands up if you want to? I should move the fuck you, I'm telling you. close enough. Is that right? Stop. Stop. Carl. Manny, I'm sorry, dog. You're my boy. Yeah? Carl. Yeah? Where he was grabbing on his head and put, you know, messing with him and stuff like that. This is just not how Nate does it. You don't see us wrestling around and loving on Nate. Ah, giving him this stuff. You don't see me doing that shit to him. He doesn't like it, that's why. He's like, come on, it's cool. He's like, it's cool. I'm like, it's cool, then go over there. Get get the fuck away from me. Why are you pacing, like, why are you pacing up like that? You gonna fight me, dude? Fuck that guy. Nate was a guy who had tremendous respect for the people who helped him get to where he is. I'm glad to be on the team, Ah, oh, man, let me tell you something. I'm very happy you're on. Ah, oh, it just meant a lot to me to have you here. I'm extremely proud of you, man. I feel like... Jen is an awesome coach, the way, way things turned out. Nate was also someone who simplified fighting. He felt as though whenever people would try to break down fighting in a complicated way, or maybe they were overanalyzing it, he would just find it ridiculous. You know, he's an emotional kid. I hear people say that all the time, you know? Oh, he's a mental f fighter, an emotional fighter. I don't even know what the fuck that means. That's the most retarded shit I ever heard. Mentally. The Diaz conviction appeared to always be that I'm ready to take the hardest fight at any possible time because I'm a true fighter. Doesn't matter about weight, doesn't matter about timing, doesn't matter about anything. There's no excuses in this game. I'm here to take on the biggest and baddest challenge. And it's an interesting thought because usually when I see those people who actively seek out the hard road, I tend to think that they're doing a service to their later life. Here's a quote by Les Brown that explains it much better. If you do what is easy, your life will be hard. Do what is hard. Your life will be easy. Now that Nate Diaz was the only Diaz brother representing in the UFC, after his victory on The Ultimate Fighter and winning the entire show, he accumulated a five fight winning streak. He had very exciting fights and actually ended up getting two submission of the night bonuses along with a fight of the night against Josh Neer. His victory against Kite Pellegrino was incredibly impressive. Nate was just in the exciting fights. He was an absolute finisher, just a dog in there when it would come to the fight game. He could drop guys with punches, he could outlast them with his cardio. Cardio was always the Diaz brothers great his strength, their ability to take a shot. They were both blessed with iron chins, but very hard to put them away. Nate was also very outlandish in the way he would submit people. He would taunt, flex on them in a celebration, and even during the submission, he would do wild things. He was very exciting, and this was a good win streak that he accumulated. It just seemed as though he may have not been getting the recognition he deserved. I think people understood that Nate was a great fighter and that he was worth watching, but when people would watch, I don't think people would say, oh, hey guys, Nate Diaz is fighting. They would probably say, you know Nick Diaz, his brother's fighting tonight. After some stellar performances, Nate Diaz then ended up running into the exact same problem that his brother Nick fell into, where he was going against wrestlers and he lost a decision to Clay Guida and Joe Stevenson. He ended up bouncing back fighting Melvin Gullard, but then he dropped a very controversial loss to Gray Maynard. Gray Maynard has a very heavy wrestling base in his skill set, and this typically did give the Diaz brothers problems. After this fight, Nate Diaz got very frustrated, and along with cutting so much weight for very small compensation, he decided to move up to 170. Even though it appeared as though he was undersized, he just thought it would be a better change because he wouldn't be killing his body as much and he could still perform to the best of his ability. This would be a very bad move in the end just because the strength of the people in the division above would now be even worse in terms of a skill set approach from a wrestling based fighter. Nate found mixed results when he moved up to welterweight. He had a good start, then found himself in matchups where he was just getting utterly dominated. Although during this period of him moving to welterweight is when we saw more controversy from the Diaz brothers. We beat him. Uh, he beat the crap out of the worst ever beat that first round. Just What's up? Me Where's my rematch, buddy? Wow. Yeah, this is this is ridiculous. This is ridiculous. Not. 
What the? This is my only concern. Not yeah. Career. My God. All right. Uh, Sometimes these things happen in MMA. A lot of testosterone in the cage. Gentlemen, we're on national television. Gentlemen, we're in national television. Now at this time, the Nick Diaz unit known as the Scrap Hack was compromised of Jake Shields, Gilbert Melendez, Nick Diaz, and Nate Diaz. These four were all seen as sort of a gang in the MMA space. It was clear that the Diaz brothers were the most controversial and outspoken. However, you could tell that all four of them were very tight. In this instance, Jake Shields was not expected to beat Dan Henderson this night, which is why it was such a massive moment, and I think that's why the Diaz brothers got extra heated, because he wasn't meant to win that fight. It was geared towards Dan Henderson dethroning Jake Shields for the title. However, in the match before this, Jake Shields had actually beat Jason Mayhem Miller, who's the gentleman who interrupts his interview, for the vacant Strike Force title. So just by Miller asking and interrupting him for a title shot, it triggered these guys off. It's some of the most iconic footage in the MMA space. What happened tonight, man? That little bitch boy came in and tried to push my boy right after he's done fighting. You want a shot of mayhem? Yeah, he was, you know, he really robbed my boy Jake out of, out of uh, getting a ten, chance to talk, you know, to well, five, five minute rounds with Henderson, man, that was a difficult, uh, you know, he, he wanted time to talk and catch his breath and then the guy's walking in, in, in his face, like you can't even really think, you know, Jake, Jake pushed him, get the fuck off me, you know. But, but you don't even get a chance to think. Commercial. Dan Henderson is the commercial, right? So he does it. He pulls off the impossible. He gets his moment to start, you know, to get his interview on CBS after pulling off this huge upset, and you get fucking goofball. You know, hey, where's my rematch running in his, you know. Oh, where's my rematch? But what do you think's going to happen? And I, and I honestly believe the Diaz brothers are taking a lot of, a, a lot of slack for this thing. Number one, Jake Shields pushed him first, and Gilbert Melendez was in the middle of that too. And let me ask anybody a question. Ask a thousand people this question. Fight breaks out next to the Diaz brothers. What do you think is going to happen? Okay? Any, anybody? Is that a shock to anybody? Really? A fight broke out with the Diaz brothers' friends and they got involved? That's weird. Come on. Give me a fucking break. Now, while Nate Diaz was having a 50-50 run at welterweight, his brother Nick was reaping the benefits of having an exciting fighting style in Strikeforce. Strikeforce was such a legit promotion at the time, and along with Scott Coker's amazing marketing, they were able to promote all three champions of the Scrap Pack. So naturally, when you thought of the Scrap Pack, you thought of Jake Shields, Nick, and Gilbert, and Nick being the leader, of course, but you didn't associate it with Nate because they were in different promotions, and the belt in Strikeforce actually meant a lot back then. It is often claimed that styles make fights. But in the case of Caesar Gracie Jiu Jitsu, it can be said styles make champions. Last year, the team collectively held the Strike Force lightweight, welterweight, and middleweight belts. Nick Diaz. The welterweight champion shed his bad boy persona, embracing a new one, unstoppable. Undefeated in his last nine contests, he pulverizes opponent after opponent into history. Fortunately now, any other promotion, even champions, aren't getting the respect they deserve because the UFC is so far ahead. Back then when Strikeforce was one or two notches below the UFC, the champions were still getting a lot of credit. This had to be quite tough for Nate Diaz at the time. I'm sure he must have had a lot of self-doubt. Don't get me wrong, it's always great to see your team winning and a lot of the time if you care about your team as much as these guys do, they win, it is a win for you and perhaps he was okay just living vicariously through them. But still taking the losses must have hurt him because he always did fight really tough guys. If you look back at his resume at the time, especially that five fight win streak after the Ultimate Fighter, he did fight really tough guys. And his stint in the UFC actually ended up being better than Nick's first stint in the UFC. Nick Diaz then proceeded to fight Paul Daly. Now this is one of the greatest fights I've ever seen. I remember at the time when I watched this, I just couldn't take my eyes off it. But now he faces Paul Daly, the veteran knockout artist who is ready to strike gold. This was the most exciting round in all of sports. If you were to ask me to recommend you an MMA fight, and I can only recommend one, this would certainly be in the top three of my list of choices. Nick Diaz won this fight in emphatic fashion. Thinking about Nick Diaz being a jiu-jitsu guy, going against Paul Daly who was knocking absolutely everyone out. Even though Paul Daly was a one-dimensional fighter, people from the UK tend to have a much stronger style when it comes to stand-up because we are very heavy in kickboxing. Paul Daly had tremendous knockout power and Nick just stood toe to toe with him and even got dropped in this fight. But his ability to outlast just was too much for Paul Daly. What a great fight. I think Nate realized that he had some issues at welterweight that he couldn't fix. Things 
things that were genetically based as well. So he moved back down to 155 and he went on a great streak here. He ended up going on a three fight winning streak and ended up working his way to a title shot. People did get behind Nate Diaz. He was starting to headline shows at the time and co and co main event shows. He was the co main to the Brock Lesnar versus Alistair Overeem UFC 141 card and he built the hell out of that fight too. His clash with Cerrone just became so interesting. Really the only personal interaction I've had with Nate is uh, at the open workout prior to this fight. I walk over to be like, hey man, what's going on? Shake his hand. Yeah, he shouldn't have done that. He's in my bracket. We're gonna fight each other. He slaps my hand out of the way and calls me a punk ass and walks off. You go your way, I'll go mine. You wanna talk to me, you just gonna enrage me and piss me off. So feed my flame. That's all I say, let's go. He was able to get in Donald Cerrone's head and really work him the whole fight. We began to get very impressed with Nate Diaz's ability to handle pressure and even handle a lot of animosity in the fights. So he was growing a lot as a fighter now. He grew basically before our eyes. Once the UFC acquired Strikeforce for a massive $40 million, the first event that happened to be put on was the Nick Diaz versus Paul Daly fight. And this was huge. And Dana was so excited about this fight once he'd watched it. He loved that the fights were so exciting to see Nick Diaz coming to the UFC now. Two months before Nate Diaz had fought Donald Cerrone, Nick Diaz was scheduled to fight George St. Pierre in a unification bout. After seeing that bout between Daly and Diaz, Dana knew to strike while the iron was hot. Nick had created such a huge interest outside of the UFC, and I believe Dana probably saw a PR opportunity to couple with Nick's personality and controversial behavior that could engage even more fans. Once the unification bout was set up for the end of October between GSP and Diaz, there was a huge issue that happened. Nick Diaz had actually missed multiple flights for the press conference and this pissed off Dana badly. Dana chose to revoke Nick Diaz's title shot, again painting him as the villain. I show up to do my job but Nick Diaz did not... I did, I talked to Nick on Monday night, you know, and uh, he, said, he said, yeah, I, this, you know, I mean you guys have interviewed, <laughs> interviewed Nick before. I got a bunch of gibberish and then he told me he was getting on the plane. We'll see what happens. Nick Diaz obviously can't handle the pressure of a main event of this magnitude. That, that's what I think. It's absolutely insane. You know, the kid flew out, he signed a contract, he sat in my office and told me to my face he wanted this and, and he was going to do everything that we needed him to do. It makes no sense. It's beyond comprehension very well. So people who, who bought tickets that don't want to come to the to, to the uh, condit fight. You know they'll have the opportunity to return those tickets, but uh, I don't think that's going to be the case. This is a great fight, and uh, it's better than buying tickets. And Diaz doesn't show up the night of the fight. <laughs> this almost seemed typical at this point. We'd always seen Nick Diaz in crazy fights and exciting fights, but then he would do something outlandish, and the media would paint him as a bad guy. But the fans deep down had never ever lost hope in Nick Diaz. They still resided with Nick Diaz in saying that we love the anti-hero. After Nick Diaz had missed that press conference, Dana White decided to announce Carlos Condit would be taking his shot. Carlos Condit was scheduled as the co-main event alongside BJ Penn, and the main event would have been GSP versus Diaz. After Nick Diaz missed that press conference, Dana decided to bump Carlos Condit to the main event by George St. Pierre and Nick Diaz to the co-main event to fight BJ Penn instead. An unforeseen circumstance happened. George St. Pierre ended up getting injured and the fight was off because Carlos Condit chose to wait for George St. Pierre. So Nick Diaz was bumped to the main event anyway in the position where he should have been all along. He was scheduled to fight BJ Penn now in a main event in his re-debut for his second stint in the UFC. Being a fan of the UFC, you just told me that Nick Diaz and BJ Penn were going to fight. I wouldn't even need any media to get hyped up. These are two guys with an absolutely stellar jujitsu background, but they only choose to box. They can both finish you with their hands, but they're incredibly dangerous on the ground. Neither one of them will ever shoot for a takedown. How can you even assess this fight? I love competition. It gets me right. I know who's in this sport. I mean, that's so not what I did. He's my favorite fighter. He's better than they are. He's better than everybody. 
I know where he came from. He came from my school. That's what I'm, as far as I'm concerned, he came from where I came from, and that's why he's good. Nick Diaz ended up putting an absolute beat down on BJ Penn. He outlasted him, and the jiu jitsu scrambles in this fight were just beautiful. Then Nick Diaz went on to have one of the greatest call outs of all time. <laughs> You've been screaming, George, even though you just beat BJ Penn. Fight. What's on your mind right now? George. I don't think George is hurt. I think he's scared. What's up? Where are you at, George? A big victory for you. Dana White again seeing the interest that Nick Diaz can garner. Nick was using his platform very well. We never saw this from Nate. Nick was able to use the right callouts at the right time, pick his battles with opponents. Nate would just simply agree to fight his opponents and not push back too much. Nick was sort of more in charge of his own career and he actually found a lot of success in doing this, thereby choosing George St. Pierre. Dana White seeing the excitement in this bout with BJ Penn and then scheduling that fight. Dana White instantly took to the press conference to begin promoting this fight and it was a hardcore MMA fans dream. I've never seen him like he was tonight. George St. Pierre flipped out tonight after Nick Diaz was in the ring. Nick needs motivation. He's got it. He's going to fight George St. Pierre. Paul yeah. Condit has agreed to step aside and get the next, uh, the next guy. He said that Nick, I quote, you're going to think I'm full of shit, but this is the truth. I, I quote, He's the most disrespectful human being I've ever met, and I'm going to put the worst beating you've ever seen on him in the UFC, is what George St. Pierre said. See how I got to come off just to get a fight? <clears throat> I got to come off like that just to get a fight in this. You know what I'm saying? I got to be the bad guy. You will point the finger, make me the bad guy. I'm the bad guy, and now I get a fight. This is where Nick Diaz's stock was at an all-time high. We'd never seen Nick Diaz reach such heights as he did after this fight. Fighting style, his 11 fight win streak, domination of BJ Penn and the fantastic call out of George St. Pierre. Without even thinking about it, he was a marketing genius. I'm trained by day, Joe Rogan podcast by night, all day. Everyone after this point wanted to see GSP versus Nick Diaz. It had become a grudge match at this point. Unfortunately, in December, we received news about GSP's injury and that he would actually have to be out now and get surgery. At this point, they created an interim title between Nick Diaz and Carlos Condit. I think because so many people wanted the Diaz versus GSP fight, we just assumed that the fight would be much bigger because the interim belt would now be on the line and it would still be a unification belt as it was originally supposed to be. Nick Diaz was then slated to fight Carlos Condit and in a stylistic way, this matchup was just fantastic. You had Carlos Condit who was an amazing stand-up fighter had significant knockout power, amazing footwork and was very unpredictable with his strike. Diaz was a come forward fighter who could submit you but will box you and outlast you. Even though we had always seen Nick Diaz as a villain or he was painted as a villain such as you saw with that Dana press conference once he missed it. This promotion, I think the UFC understood that they needed to push this fight a little bit more. It wasn't that Nick Diaz couldn't sell but the Nick Diaz versus GSP handle would have been much more popular. So in order to give this fight a little extra flair, the UFC went to their prime time series they do for bigger fights and they and they really worked hard to delve into the stories of both fighters of this fight to garner more interest so that the GSP fight with Diaz would be much bigger. This I looked on YouTube and I've seen some videos of him because I haven't seen him since he was a kid. He's the exact same. He doesn't make eye contact. He talks very slow and deliberate. Takes a breath between words. I mean when I saw him on that video he was the exact same kid i moved around schools a little bit one school has got one type of people and then another school has got another type of people i don't know how much i learned in school but i did get to learn a lot about different types of people it's not so hard i really stood out as like a hardcore guy when i'm not so hardcore in a hardcore school so it was just no fitting in anywhere i was gonna fight with this kid and all his friends were like hey well you're hey you're gonna fight this guy you know he's, you know you're gonna fight uh you're gonna fight Justin, and I'd be like, hey, fuck you. You know what I mean? Because they think it's funny, or, talk, or someone will come up and be like, yeah, you're gonna fight Justin Acello, he's gonna whoop your ass. And I'd be like, yeah, fuck you, I'm gonna whoop your ass. And then next thing you know, oh, you with that dude, you, you know, you mess with that dude, and now you're gonna, oh, I got problems with this dude, I got problems with this dude. High school was hard time. <laughs> High school was hard time. 
This time they actually delved into Nick Diaz's personal story. Even though Nick Diaz had usually come across as the most misunderstood person in the whole world, the promotion to this fight actually shed light on how relatable he actually is. We know that when he does interviews, he's pretty uncomfortable. His public speaking ability. It's not like I'm, you know, oh, I'm just paranoid or something. I'm not paranoid. I'm not stupid. You know, that's why I win these fights now, because I'm not stupid. You get a little pumped up, and you feel like that when you're going to school, you know how I think you look. Then they put these cameras on me, I'm sitting here waiting to fight, and then yeah, I'm, in, I'm, in, I'm back in high school. And it's a mess, and you're like, oh, why don't you like the camera, why don't you like the camera? I'm like, take the camera out of my face already. It doesn't appear that anyone's actually given him the tools to express himself verbally and his coach Steve Heath mentions that because of fighting it allows Nick to express himself the way he wants to because he can be creative in the way he fights, fight how he wants and it's completely down to him. He gets upset. When you ask me why he gets upset, it's his inability to express himself verbally. That's why he's a fighter. But when he gets in that ring, he's a poet. He's a poet in motion. In the promotion to this fight, we learned so much about Nick Diaz's backstory and we gravitated towards him even more. It wasn't just Nick Diaz the thug anymore, it was Nick Diaz the people's champion. Not gonna make it. He was always told you don't belong here and you know, you're, you're not one of these rich kids. And, and you know, when he fights, I think he does bring some of that back. After a five round technical battle with a lot of trash talk, Stockton slapped, spinning shit, Carlos Condit ended up swiping the decision for this bout, much to the surprise of a lot of fans. In real time, I'd actually scored this for Nick Diaz myself. And when I watched it back, I found that maybe my bias was actually in Nick Diaz's favor. But even still, I still like to say that Nick Diaz won rounds one, two, and five. This became a meme for the last decade that Nick Diaz won one, two, and five and always has. So his stock never dropped in this fight because a lot of fans actually thought that he was the victor no matter what. After the Condit bout, Nate to Diaz went on to fight Jim Miller in what appeared to be a number one contenders bout where he headlined a fight night. It was a very exciting fight and Jim Miller had a fantastic style. He was also an expert on the ground and Nate Diaz actually subbed him with a guillotine while Jim Miller's tongue was still sticking out. It's an incredibly brutal finish and I recommend if you haven't seen it to please Please watch it. This earned Nate Diaz his title shot at then champion Benson Henderson. Unfortunately, in Nate Diaz's title shot, he lost to Benson Henderson. He got thoroughly outclassed and negated for five strong rounds. Then ended up having a very inconsistent run for the next few fights, and he took a very bad knockout loss to Josh Thompson. Looking for the This was one of the worst losses we'd ever seen. Nick Diaz actually threw in the towel for Nate at this point. That's how bad the head kick that landed was. This was almost like unseen. I think at this point, we started to think maybe we've seen the ceiling of Nate Diaz. Dana White even criticized his ability to pull in numbers. He's not a needle mover. His brother is a needle mover. He's not. I love Nate Diaz. Nate Diaz is actually one of my favorite kids. I, I always got along with Nate. Nate was always great. Lowest rated Fox show ever. His number, he doesn't pull the numbers. After Nate Diaz suffered a loss in his title bout to Benson Henderson, Nick Diaz then went on to fight George St. Pierre. Even though he had lost to Carlos Condit in the previous bout, a lot of the fans were begging for this fight still just because they knew that there was so much potential in that bout and it just appeared to be one of those fights that the fans wanted to see, just to see the build up, to see how they would clash on the ground. A lot of people were taking stock in Nick's Jiu Jitsu and whether it could counteract George St. Pierre's wrestling at the time, which was very dominant. Along with the fact that Nick Diaz also had a huge name at the time, it made sense for the UFC to put on a fight of this magnitude in order to gain some money as well. In the promotion of this bout, Nick Diaz basically played the role of a bully. He would attack George St. Pierre with a verbal abuse. He would constantly berate him on the media call and at the press conferences. Hard regardless through this shit, but I don't have people, you know, telling me off and handing me water bottles left and right. I pull up to a stoplight the other day and some fucking 40-year-old lady, some, some soccer mom, sticks her head out the window and she's like, I hope GSP beats your ass. We're in fucking Lodi, bitch. I'm like, are you serious? You know what? When you say something, everybody fucking believes it, dude. And George likes to say I remind him of the bullies that picked on him growing up or they had to deal with. You know, I'm going to say, like, how many, how many times you uh, had a gun to your head, George? How many times... How many times did someone put a gun to your head? How many kids put gum in your hair growing up? Like, should I go further back? I mean, we have to deal with these things. I believe Nick, Nick is the best guy right now in mixed martial art, and I'm fighting him because he's the best guy. It has nothing to do with... Yeah, yeah but the, you told the fans you told the fans that I deserve to get beat down, and you told the fans that 
Did I chase you around or you told the you fans? You told the fan I was scared of you and avoiding you. And yeah, everything. I got the fight too, right? You can understand Absolutely. that. I'm working towards something here, all right? Everybody knows that. They're selling you all wolf tickets, people. You're eating them right up. George here is selling you wolf tickets. Dana here, he's selling you wolf tickets. The UFC is selling you some wolf tickets. You guys are eating them right up. Jake Shields, Gilbert Melendez, Nate Diaz, everybody, everybody from the town, thank you very much. George St. Pierre had a wealth of experience defending his title against plenty of trash talkers and thoroughly dominated Nick Diaz. George St. Pierre later went on to say that he used the footage from the Benson Henderson versus Nate Diaz fight in order to plan for this fight. Benson Henderson ended up forging the game plan to beat the Diaz brothers. Nick Diaz then took a long layoff after losing to George St. Pierre. However, his name was still very large and even though he was inactive people couldn't wait for him to come back he sort of has that following where he will always be relevant in the media or someone will always ask a question regarding nick diaz if there's a whisper about where he is a fan will mention it in between the george st pierre and anderson silver fight diaz was seen partying quite a lot on his snapchat and on social media nick diaz went on to fight anderson silver a huge fight anderson silver who's middleweight nick diaz decided to step up to face him in a huge bout no one knew what to expect here because Anderson Silva was far more technical than Nick Diaz but would he get weared down by the pressure of Nick? Neither of these guys will take this fight to the ground. No one knew what to expect with this fight. There was a huge size size advantage for Anderson Silva but we had two fighters who liked to trash talk in the cage which should make for an exciting bout. Unfortunately the fight itself was not that exciting but the first round had one of the most iconic moments in the UFC. Look at this. Nick Diaz is doing an Anderson Silva, and John McCarthy says, let's fight. I don't think Anderson will be goaded in. Look at this. This is, this is the greatest thing I've ever seen. Nick was going to do whatever he was going to do. Unfortunately, this would be the last time we see Nick Diaz fight. Even though he suffered a loss against Anderson Silva, he was always going to be the type to draw in numbers, but no one could have predicted what would have happened next. In this fight, we learn that both fighters tested positive for different substances. Anderson Silva testing positive for two performance enhancing drugs, receiving a one year suspension, while Nick Diaz tests positive for marijuana and received a suspension of five years. The punishment is absolutely not fitting for the crime, and again, it felt as though it was Nick Diaz against the world. We always knew that Nick Diaz had a love hate relationship with fighting. In order to love fighting, I have to hate it. There's no love in this without hate. You gotta love it so you want it so bad that you're pushing yourself to those limits to where you just simply hate it. And if you ain't there to where you hate it, then good luck trying to love this. However, I believe at this point, he most definitely fell out of love with fighting. I wanted to just get up and tell them all like, look, you guys are way the f out of line. You guys have been trying to hold me down from day one. That's pretty much this whole sport has been trying to keep me from where I belong. And that's the number one position. I'm the biggest draw. I'm the best fighter. I've been fighting for longer. I've been throwing more punches than everybody in the sport. I'm going to dodge more punches than everyone in this sport. And that's the bottom line. That's what's really going on. We got a whole system trying to hold me down. Dana White went on to say, what I think isn't important. I have no say in the matter. They don't give a shit what I think. People who know MMA know that. I hope that in the previous act, I haven't glossed over Nate Diaz's accomplishments in a disrespectful or dismissive type of way. It was just that I'm trying to bring to light how their careers differed in that the magnitude of Nick Diaz's aura was so massive compared to his younger brother, Nate. It wasn't that Nate didn't accomplish a lot. He had some great finishes, some great fights and some great wins. It was just impossible to think of Nate Diaz without associating with his big brother, Nick. However, whenever we looked at Nick Diaz's accomplishments or the fight he was in, he was looked at as a solo entity. Once the unjustly suspension was handed down to Nick Diaz in the courtroom, he had a lot to say afterwards and was caught up by interviews after. I'm, I'm, I'm pretty pissed off, you know what I mean? Like, uh, I got into the sport um, for the, you know, for like this exact reason of, of being stuck in a room like that with, with people like that. It's me. Here they got me over here. I can't even go. I, I can't even go. Uh, my brother's got a fight coming up. My brother's. Are you mean to tell me I can't even go and corner my brother where he goes in into? In, this ain't a sport. This is war. This is warfare. This, this is a war game. He's going in there. He's going in there to fight for his life. I can't even go stand next to him. 
they, they, you know, deprived me of, of, of not just money now, but the right to stand up for not only what I believe in, but for my little brother. I can't even go and help my little brother. And it's like, you know, I'm like, I'm like, y'all can get knocked the fuck out. All you, all, all, all of these whole little everybody in the room right now. And that's why this feeling, what I got right now from uh, being in that room too long, is exactly why I became a fighter. It's exactly why I walked out of classrooms. This is exactly why, uh, you know, I, I couldn't make it through high school. I had little gangbangers trying to start start up with me. I, I had little fights here and there. I couldn't make attendance. I wasn't gonna go to college. I had someone tell me the other day, like, oh yeah, you could have gone to college if you want to. I was like, really? I'm like, I got moved out of school. Every I got moved out three or four grammar schools. They tried to put me on drugs. Okay. Then the teacher's gonna go like, oh yeah, you know, uh, uh, yeah, yeah. Sorry, he's acting up. Today. You know, he didn't take his medication. Then kids, next thing you know, kids are going like, okay, oh, what's wrong? You didn't take your medication today. And I'm like, fuck, what? You know what I mean? So, so people are like, oh, you're so stupid. All this and that. You didn't go to college. You know, I can read and write. I'm like, what? What more do I need? What more do you want from me? I fight. That's why I fight. That's what I do. Um, you know, I got, if I want if I want to make money, I got to go into the ring and take it from somebody. We can see by Nick's comments after the court case that he's genuinely worried about his brother. He probably feels as though he is the one who's responsible for the bigger fights, for the income and for looking after his brother. And he feels as though the one thing he had in this life has now been taken away. And it was a trend of things never going his way or being looked at in a bad light. And here it's basically the darkest light that they could have given him. Brother. I can't even go and help my little brother. And it's like, you know, I'm like, the suspension was handed down in September of 2015. Nate Diaz had taken a long break after his inconsistent streak when he lost to RDA and ended up being booked against Michael Johnson in December, three months after Nick's suspension. This would actually be the fight that skyrockets him. Not initially and not straight away, this would be the beginning of Nate Diaz's superstardom. Nate Diaz outworked Michael Johnson, fought at his own pace and was outboxing him thoroughly, even taunting him within the fight and the performance was fantastic. But it it wasn't the performance that got him into the upper echelon of superstars. Got it. Fuck that. Conor McGregor, you're taking everything I work for, motherfucker. I'm going to fight your fucking ass. You know what's the real fight and what's the real money fight is me. Not these clowns that you already punked at the press conference. Don't no one want to see that. You know you beat them already. That's the easy fight. You want that real shit. I don't know how much stock we put into Nate Diaz's call out of Conor McGregor. At this point, a lot of people were calling out Conor. Considering that one week before Nate Diaz defeated Michael Johnson, Conor McGregor defeated Jose Aldo for the featherweight title at 145. So I think because he was putting feelers out there about the 155 title, he was previously a champion in Cage Warriors, a double champion, and he wanted to do the same here in the UFC. I think Nate Diaz saw an opportunity to maybe capitalize on this. Conor Conor McGregor was booked against RDA, the 155 champion, which makes sense. However, when RDA pulled out due to an injury, Nate Diaz was the fill-in substitute for this fight. So Nate Diaz coming in on short notice decided to take the fight just because, I guess, of the Diaz mentality. He got a pay increase and he did a good job to promote this fight. He did suffer a verbal onslaught from Conor McGregor, but he held his own very well in the press conference, had a few good zingers. I tell you, I like, I like Nick's little bro. I do. I honestly not like, I like Nick, uh, Nick's little bro, you know what I mean? How can you not like him? Congratulations, you did it. You know, most people, when they get that red panty night on me, they ring home to their wife. Baby, we did it. We did it. Nate rings Nick. Baby, we did it. So, give a fuck either. He's like a, he's like a little cholo gangster from the hood. But at the same time, but at the same time, he coaches kids to jiu on a Sunday morning and goes on bike rides with the elderly. How about that? 20,000 to show, 20,000 to win. Not even a win bonus. Is it? His full check wasn't even a performance at a night bonus. Now He's a ninja, I'm the ninja. Ninja Gaiden, American Ninja, Irish Ninja. Represent your oh boy, I'm right here. I, I don't get our shape. He gets our shape. His fight against the Sanyos, he looked like the, he was the skinniest fat guy I've ever seen in my life. Relax, relax, Nick. He's doing good. He's doing good up here, Nick. Relax. You don't got, you're playing touch butt with that dork in the park. I said...
but it was all about the fight and if there was ever a fight to win this was the one after a first round where nate diaz was under a lot of attrition he soldiered through and his cardio was actually a lot better than connor's he ended up battering connor in the second round rocking him very badly with the boxing till connor shot for a takedown diaz then choked out connor on the ground and blew the internet up With this pick, Nate Diaz had some amazing lines after this fight, and this fight definitely changed the career perspective that we look back on so far. A lot of the things he said became ended up becoming very catchy, and he was officially a superstar. He handed the biggest pay-per-view star in the business, a guy who couldn't be touched, was seen as invincible, a very devastating finishing loss. Nate Diaz, <laughs> you just shook up the world. How's that feel? Hey, I'm not surprised, motherfuckers. Yeah. He's shooting for a takedown, yeah. and I'm like, oh, you're a wrestler now. <laughs> you're a wrestler. I remember I'm the black belt in jiu-jitsu. If you don't do something right now, if you don't do something right now, two rounds. That's what I said, two rounds. Look at my fights, two rounds. Two, uh, two rounds and you fight me. Same thing. Did you think your brother was in trouble after the first round? No, or shut you down, still shut down. Get the shit out of here. Seriously? All right. He capitalized on this moment. We saw him on a lot of talk shows and things like that until the rematch was booked. Conor McGregor had a lot of power in the UFC and the UFC granted Conor a rematch to fight Nate Diaz six months later. There was a lot of issues about the scheduling. However, it did get done in the end for UFC 202. He hits hard for a 145 pound guy. You know, I didn't think he, he hit like no Superman or anything. Talk to or about Nate Diaz for a while, and one name is sure to come up. Nick, the older brother who's been Nate's guide throughout his childhood. I went there because he heard I was fighting. He was like, let's go to the gym. And I was like, I'm a chill. And he's like, he's like, you better come to the gym with me after that performance you put on earlier at the park. I was like, man, I gotta, I gotta go to the gym and work out. I was embarrassed now. Nick is a... Uh, Nick's my fearless leader, man. You know, we got a whole academy in Stockton. It's the Nick Diaz Academy. You'll do nothing. Shut your fucking mouth, you'll do nothing. You'll do fucking nothing. Not one of you will do nothing. Get the fuck out of here. Fuck you. Up and move like, I crazy, give me crazy. I like, I'm where I come from, homeboy. Like, everybody's crazy, so, so you ain't fooling nobody. Try to act up the most you want. We still got a fight. This was also a great fight with a lot of build up, and it's one of the highest selling pay per views ever. Even though Connor thoroughly dominated Nate for the first couple of rounds, Nate Diaz had a very good finishing sequence in the third round. You almost finished Connor McGregor, and we thought we were going to see a repeat of the first fight. However, Connor did outlast, but the fight was back and forth, and a lot of people have still scored it for Nate Diaz. In that way, it didn't really drop Nate Diaz's stock. Nate was still a star at this moment. I believe Nate felt as though he was unjustly done by the UFC. Whatever Connor wanted, if he got a rematch, he got it. Nate would have wanted a rematch afterwards but he was never gonna get it. He was also fighting against the system he felt, the same thing that his brother had seen before. And this felt like a large reason as to why he took such a large inactivity period. Nate had also said many times, they got Connor the win against me and then pushed him right into Floyd and Eddie Alvarez a give me fight. That way they could put Nate in the rearview mirror again. After the second bout with Connor McGregor where Diaz suffered a decision loss, he took a long break. Initially I thought this was a mistake just because I felt as though the iron was so hot. Please strike, continue to capture don't just sit back and light the cigar. Keep throwing more coals on the fire in order to keep people entertained. He took a long break, but he stayed training the entire time. It wasn't until he saw Anthony Pettis knock out Stephen Wonderboy Thompson, which was massively surprising by the way. Nate saw an opportunity to capitalize and Nate's management team ended up contacting the Pettis management team. And there was actually a backstory there where they had had a bit of beef previously. So this fight did sell itself. It was under the heavyweight title, which was DC and Miocic, and it did huge numbers. This actually boosted the card massively. Dana White would even go on to admit that Nate is officially a needle mover now. We couldn't just say that Nate was a needle mover if he fought against Connor because Connor against anyone would have sold. So this really validated Nate's star status. His pay-per-view ever and you heard this crowd tonight it seemed like he was the main event. They were Diaz, Diaz all night. Do you think that we have another you know Rousey McGregor level, level star with Nate Diaz given the way people are reacting to him now? Yeah yeah it's pretty tough to deny. Yeah.
He's a needle mover now. <laughs> Nate Diaz, after defeating Anthony Pettis, would then go on to make a fantastic call out of superstar Jorge Masvidal, who had an absolutely breakout year. It was a very small call out, and Nate Diaz understood his value at this point. Nate Diaz had made a mind shift. He had always seen Nick Diaz's results in his career, but he probably wasn't exactly sure of what he was doing different because they both had the same kind of anticipation to fighting, the same motivation to fight, and even the same fighting style. It took me a second to come out of soldier mode, Diaz said. What's smart? What's better for me? What's really going on here? I kind of woke up and was like, hold up, what have I been doing? It just continued from wherever it had started, me being down to fight anybody, being told to fight whoever, no questions asked. At first, I just flipped out. I started looking at numbers and I was like, whoa, you guys are making this much? That guy's making this money? The company's bringing in this much? It's time to get paid. I spoke right up. Over time, I realized, wow, I need to get some leverage. This is long overdue. You know what I'm saying? And it goes by the moment. Who knows what's going to happen after this fight? What happens if I get murked? What happens if I lose this fight? This is the blueprint. Fighters need to start imagining themselves as the product because we're the product of the business. I ain't free. I don't know why everybody is acting like they are. Nate understood his worth and Nate understood how to market himself now. He used the same call outs that Nate did previously and was in control of his career a little bit more and it paid off massively. If you've never heard of the compound effect, the compound effect is the idea that small actions build up over time. Imagine you had the choice of taking $1 million right now or a single penny that doubled in value every day for 31 days. If you picked the penny, you'd have $10,737,418.24 on day 31. This reminds me a little bit of Nate Diaz's situation in the fact that he may have chose the penny and it took so long for the compounded work, the collection of champions in his training camp and for him to finally get the shine he deserved after, after grinding so long, after being such an exciting fighter and then eventually it did compound into superstardom, financial success and freedom of his career. Nate Diaz went on to fight Jorge Masvidal at Madison Square Garden being the headline act and he went up against Canelo that night in pay-per-view and as far as I'm well aware they absolutely smashed Canelo's pay-per-view numbers. Canelo was actually sitting in the back waiting for the main event between Masvidal and Diaz to end so that he could make a ring walk so that his network would be happy. Even though Nate Diaz lost his fight by a doctor stoppage he was able to get the same opinion from the fans that his brother had always had which is if you don't finish me it doesn't mean anything thereby not losing any stock after a while he ended up fighting leon edwards and even against leon he got out thoroughly dominated but in the last round he had an amazing moment where he almost finished leon edwards taunted him rocked him very badly and perhaps could have finished him if he pushed the gas a little bit more But again, he somehow, even though he loses these fights, he comes out as the winner. So he's going to continue to have this aura. Nate Diaz is an absolute superstar. He's made it. Every single time Nate Diaz had a platform, all he did was uplift Nick Diaz, his brother, the greatest fighter in the world in his eyes. Nick Diaz was his hero. In Nate's eyes, Nick Diaz is the greatest fighter who ever lived. He's his hero, and that's why he uplifts him all the time. Nate appreciates Nick so much because Nick invested in Nate's life, and it's led him to where he is today. The greatest fighter of all time, Nick Diaz. Uh, my brother is responsible for anything I've even done at all, you know. He, the whole impact is from him. You want to talk about baptizing my younger brother? That's on you. That's my baby brother. You don't talk like that for nobody. He's 100% the main reason why I'm here. Yeah, it's always better when he's here. Um, uh, he's the one who started me on the whole journey. And, uh, I mean, come on, you know, it's good. And I got the Nick Diaz Army with me. We're here to take, take motherfuckers out. That's why he continues to thank him. In making this video, I actually learned that there is no shadow of Nick Diaz. It's just Nate Diaz who never ever tried to exceed Nick Diaz. He only ever wanted to lift up Nick and repay him for all the investment he did in his childhood and in his adulthood as well. It's a great story to be honest. And what I would just like to say is that if you're only a fan of Nate Diaz because you're a recent fan of mixed martial arts, without Nick Diaz, 
There is no Nate Diaz. Now that Nick Diaz's comeback has been announced, this will be the first time we've got two superstar UFC Diaz brothers coexisting at the same time. Even though Nick Diaz got suspended, he felt as though it was a bad thing because he couldn't be with his brother, couldn't work together with his brother. Felt as though that was actually the perfect window for Nate to flourish. Perhaps there was never any room for two Diaz brothers to flourish at the same time until now. That's the end of the video guys, I just want to thank you for watching so much, it really means the world. just want to also thank you guys for over a thousand subscribers, it's about 1900 right now, it's truly just amazing. I'm going to leave a more heartfelt comment about it in the pinned comment below. Massive Slong X says, remember me when you hit 10k, 100k and 1 million subs. Man, thank you so much, those are really really kind words and I'm so overwhelmed by all of your comments, it truly means so much to me. I'm a guy who doesn't know anything about video editing or narration or technical anything, you know, to do with mics or anything. I'm just, I'm just a guy who loves sports and I'm so grateful for all your comments. Thank you so much for this comment. It means the world. If you really think I can hit a million subs, that's just unbelievable belief in me. Thank you so much. I'm really grateful. Imagine making these completely pointless videos. Sorry. Civilized Wham says, imagine making these completely pointless videos though, just getting all these clips, images, putting it all together and for what? Who gives a F? Firstly bro, thanks you for your comment, appreciate it, thanks for watching I guess. Um, this is just something that I like, these are just videos that I used to love to watch, I still do love to watch these kinds of videos, but I just felt as though there was topics that maybe I recognised that I hadn't seen on YouTube so I just thought maybe I should make a few videos and see if other people resonated with me and I just want to say if you you can't really say criticize people for liking what they like or you shouldn't really criticize people for liking what they like it takes all sorts to make this world and um, i just want to say whatever you're doing in life i hope you make it brother and um yeah it's all good even if you hate it if you love it no problem man if you hate me i love you if you love me i still love you bro oh. this says fantastic video great job love when youtube recommends such a good video that i get sucked into for over half an hour man jonathan thank you so much um the youtube algorithm definitely helped i don't actually know what happened but for some reason my masvidal and connor video did blow up which i'm so grateful for and especially to all of you so thank you so much for your kind words and i'll continue to try my best to make more and more videos for you um and i just want to say to everyone else i read every single comment that comes through i genuinely thought i'd be able to respond to every comment because i didn't expect the channel to get so many subs so fast but i will get to all of them but i just want to let you guys know that i read every single comment i see them all and i just want to say i'm so grateful even if they were mean even if they were but most of them were really nice thank you guys and um yeah honestly love you guys genuinely